YouTube, or should I say Spotify, wherever you're watching this. Uh, hello and welcome to our brand new podcast. I am uh, Farfa, your host of sorts for this podcast, alongside the reigning champion, Joshua Schmidt. Hello, everybody. Uh, we're going to be taking you through what is hopefully going to become a household name in Yu-Gi-Oh! discourse. Uh, for those of you with long commutes to work or school, uh, we hope we're going to give you a fun little interesting segment. Weekly is the plan. Uh, that you can tune into going over current events, new cards, and hopefully some deep dives into interesting and controversial topics. Yeah, uh, really excited to get this off the ground because having one of the best players of the in the world right now and Josh giving you perfect information <laughs> week in and week out. Uh, yeah, is I exciting. mean, let me tell you, we have we have like four YCS wins and a Master Duel Worlds win between the two of us. So that's if that's not some All resource you're looking for, then cards on the table. Like that's yeah. that's what you've got right now. Uh, so I'm excited uh, about all the kinds of special guests and topics we're going to be going through. Um, so hopefully with your feedback and your comments, telling us what you would like to see in the future, what you would like to, uh, yeah. you know, any suggestions and feedback, you know, we're more than welcome to, uh, I'm more than happy to take that on board and really excited for this. So uh, yeah, before we go through the itinerary, uh, any opening statements of sorts, Mr. Schmidt? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm particularly excited uh, to be talking about a lot of general topics. Of course, we're going to always try to keep up with what's going on in the world of Yu-Gi-Oh! Like, you know, current current discussions and current news that have been revealed. But I also want to make, uh, make this a thing where we talk about stuff that is kind of like, you know, timeless. But like things that just need to be talked about at, at like any point and... Uh, you know, we're just going to yeah. make it a lot. A lot of it's also going to be feedback based. You know, if we notice you, you like that kind of stuff. Um, so we're we're definitely going to be keeping an eye out for the the comments on the YouTube channel. And uh, I don't know if there's a way for people to engage on Spotify. If there's a way to leave comments or in any way, shape, or form that we can see. Um, I'm, I'm going to be very playlist. very interested in seeing how you guys like certain types of of podcast content. Keep in mind, it is the first time uh, for me uh, as well to to make a podcast happen. So just main form of content that's supposed to be listened to, right? And so, so you know, keep that in mind. We are also learning and we're trying to make this as interesting as possible for you guys. So make sure to give us the feedback that we need. Yeah, the general topics as well, something I'm excited for in the future. You know, we're going to do deep dives into like, you know, we might have an entire episode dedicated to combo decks, a, a whole episode on floodgates. <laughs> there will uh, be so an entire any... episode dedicated to why Block Dragon should be banned. Absolutely. And Circular. We'll do a little special one on, on that. The history of Circular. <laughs> the Circular uh, special. So, you know, and uh, if you have any suggestions for who you would like to be, uh, who you'd like to see on the show, you know, let us know. Um, so, for example, you know, we, of course, there's popular people you want to see, but it has to be relevant, right? So if we're going to do a suspended player list podcast, you know, get Distant Coder on, etc. Right? That makes sense, you know, for example. <laughs> I'm just laughing so much. The people that are listening to this episode are not going to see it, but you have two pixels in your camera right now. It's phenomenal. Yeah, for, for some reason, my video code... We're gonna have you've to chosen the perfect for day for your camera to not work because we're doing like listen-only content right now. So it's it's fine. Yep. It's... <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's get into our uh, our itinerary today. Yes, um, all right. We'll give you like a little breakdown of what exactly we're going to be talking about and the subtopics. If you want to maybe give us the TCG portion first, Josh. Yeah, so we're going to talk about TCG and OC, uh, not OCG, uh, Master Duel in, in some, some episodes are going to be dedicated to one of the two, but usually we're going to try to include a little bit of both worlds. Um, for the first episode, we decided to talk about some currently occurring things in the TCG. Mainly, we're going to have a quick look at the two player starter. Uh, that just came out. I think you've all, all also done influencer openings for it, so you know exactly what's in there. And we have uh, another topic coming up, which is the upcoming format, the current situation in the TCG, which is we're looking at the year of the fire. So we're going to talk about that a little bit, you know. Um, and most importantly, when it comes to that, we're going to have a little bit of a discussion on how expensive Yu-Gi-Oh! is to play right now and how expensive it's going to be in the future and whether that's reasonable or whether it's not. That is the most important stuff we're going to be talking about when it comes to TCG related stuff on today's episode. Yeah, why card costs money? I, it's been all over X or Twitter. Uh, you've all been <laughs> taking part in the discourse. I should have bought it when it was uh, just released. Those wanted, huh? You should have. You should have spent fifty per <laughs> piece of uh, square cardboard instead of a hundred or whatever it's at right now. Yeah. So we're gonna see how long that takes us, but then yeah, we were gonna do we're gonna touch on the current master duel format, you know, super heavy samurai apocalypse, uh, in a little bit as well, which is another pleasant topic. Bunch of pleasant topics today, huh? Yeah, 
yeah, this is uh, this is what it's all about, baby. We're getting straight into the nitty gritty and the the meat grinder of all of the uh, things that are making the community angry right now. So, uh, shall we start off with the two player set? I suppose. Yes, let Let's us proceed with well, the two player starter set. Here's here's my uh, view on this thing. Um, I feel like it's very hard for us who live in this like bubble of yeah. the sort of mid range to semi competitive to hardcore competitive aspect mm -hmm. of Yu-Gi-Oh! And so when you try and judge a product like this, it's really hard because you basically yeah. just need like test subjects. Like you need two people who just don't <laughs> play the game, this, throw yeah. them down into a game and then say, go ahead, play uh, with this starter set and see how you feel about it. Because there's been, shall we say, very mixed opinions on yeah. the two-player starter set. Yeah, so just for context, the two-player starter is a, a product that you can buy. I believe it's priced at around 20 bucks. And the, the purpose of it is to get completely uh, new players into the game. People that basically have maybe like not even a single idea on how to play this game. Maybe you've seen the anime uh, back in the day, but like no idea on how to play it. And they get set up with two decks uh, that are pre-constructed. And it even says on the packaging, you are not supposed to shuffle them for your first go because there is a manual that guides you through a scripted duel, right? Where they go step by step. They're like, okay, you draw the top five cards of that deck. Uh, those are the five cards you have right now. Those are the options you have. This is how you normal summon your first monster. And then it goes step by step through the deck, right? It is literally a uh, solo mode or tutorial, like in real life. Yeah, it's an IRL, IRL uh, Master Duel tutorial mode, right? The, the one exactly. thing I find cool about that idea is that it kind of gives them the option to guide you through the easy stuff first and then let you draw some of the more... Uh, complicated cards i want to say later on because you i i believe you open with like what is it five vanillas right uh, and five they're just like okay here too. here's your vanillas that's the attack points that's the defense points that's the level you can only summon the ones with four stars or less on the first turn right um and then you you keep drawing into more and more mechanics you're like okay now i've drawn a spell card and then the book tells you how to use that one now you draw a trap how do you use that one so on and so forth right and it even has some amount of um some amount of extra deck included, right? Yeah, so that's the context. That's how the uh, set works. Yeah. And I think for 20, that's like fine, personally. I don't, I think I, people are expecting yeah. a lot here. I so think I've, people... I've said the same thing that you said earlier yesterday to my stream when we went into looking at them because I hadn't seen what was in them yet. And I had already people, of course, in chat being like, this is a huge scam, terrible product, all that kind <laughs> of stuff, right? That was the first thing I read, right? And I'm like, First of all, I said the same thing that you said, which is like, it's probably for none of you guys, right? None of the people that are in my stream right now, which are mostly probably people that know how to play this game, right? I would hope so. Um, uh, okay, sure. <laughs> questionable, but for the most part, it is not for us, right? So I, I don't think we are all in the position to judge whether this is, is, is good or not. Because obviously, I mean, yeah, uh, card quality reprint wise, which is how everyone in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community just looks at it. Yeah, you're not. You're not. No, no one's been asking for a reprint of freaking whatever vanilla you draw as your first card, like the the Elemental Hero Sparkman reprint. Yeah, it's not good. Spoilers, not a good reprint. But it's Don't not what it's about, right? for anyone. I mean, you get a Zeus though. Yeah, that's uh, that's I suppose like a twenty buck Zeus. I guess people are excited about. So yeah, um. I, I don't know, maybe we're being uh, maybe we're being biased or shilly or whatever you want to call it. But I think like a lot of players just don't seem to recognize like it's OK for a product to not be work to not be for you. Yeah, exactly. Um, Only because it's I, not for you doesn't mean it's a bad product. Yeah. Uh, but again, it's hard to. So even if we do look at it from the perspective of, hey, this is a product for new players. Do we think that this is a good product for new players? Well, number one, it's hard to judge because we have been playing the game for years and years and it's you know it's impossible to just delete all of your background information yeah. pick it up and try it out you would literally have to just watch two people who have never touched Yu-Gi-Oh try and play it and see how it pans out i don't know how much testing they would have mm -hmm. done on it um but it'd be interesting to see for me personally i feel like it's too wordy um okay. right like just picking up like a, this booklet like this actual just like boeing 747 construction manual okay. to like play out a game it feels like there's just a lot of information overload i uh, i will one. say to that like from my own perspective when you look at it from the perspective of someone like i do play board games a decent amount in my free time and it's like it's not unusual to 
get a new game, right? And then just have to read through it for a while, right? Like the booklet, like it's a normal thing, right? I'm just significantly more TikTok brain than you are, that, I guess. That might be but, fair, but like if you are playing if you're getting a new board game, like you you have to plan in some time to to make sure you learn the rules. Like that is something that uh you know, sometimes <laughs> we'll have a new board game that we haven't played before and we'll be like, "Will we play this tonight?" Well, we only have like 2 or 3 hours. That's probably not enough to completely understand yeah, what's I'm going on. Spend reading the instructions. So I, I played from the that perspective. I don't think one. it's that bad. And on on another note, I, I tried to look at it from from a from a perspective where if I tried to learn a different card game right now, like let's say I was interested in joining whatever other card game is out there that I have never played before. And then people told me, hey, there's this product, 20 bucks, you and a friend get to learn the basics of the game. Uh, most of the cards in here, they're, they're not going to be good, though, but I wouldn't be expecting that from a tutorial thing anyways, right? And then they're like, yeah, that's 20 bucks, right? I, I, I wouldn't feel like that's outrageous, you know, if, the, if, if it teaches you the game and comes with some sort of cards. Like, I mean, you'll be able to use some of the cards yeah. going forward, so I don't know. The next criticism that I think people have been lodging at this is that, well, this doesn't really show you how the game is actually played, which is like, okay, sure, <laughs> fair mean... enough, you know. You don't have Calarium, Meek, and Visas in your hand. That, that, <laughs> that's fair. You know, some people would have preferred if that was the tutorial mode, yeah, I right? Mean, it and doesn't. You... It doesn't. Fair. You're, you're not wrong, but how would yeah. you do that? Exactly. It's baby step. You can't just jump into like, all right, let's see what one gazelle can do, right? Like that's, <laughs> You're like, like, here's a MathMex circular. Is the first yeah. card you've drawn in your hand. Luckily for you, there's a MathMex Sigma in your deck that you can send to special summon this card. You're now going to uh, activate the Sigma. To, to the, no, no. <laughs> we've, we've literally seen evidence and, you know, re recorded and historical, just cemented out there in the world what it is for someone to pick up like a gazelle and see what happens. It is so much information. Yeah. It is so much overloaded um, stuff going on that if someone who's playing the game for the first time, just, they don't need that. And I think like it goes back to the point that I don't think this is for you, right? As as a player, um, for the for a lot of the people who are sort of complaining about the uh, <laughs> the non complexity of it, it's like vanilla monsters are absolutely fine to learn the game. They should have like, made that's... one of the decks Rika and one of the decks Math Mech, and they're like, uh, the first step, you roll the dice to see who goes first. Who's won the <laughs> dice roll? Okay, your experience ends here. You've rolled a six, robot. you've won the duel. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah, to be fair, Lokai is a normal monster, so, you know, they, <laughs> they missed an opportunity there. Yeah. They could have put Lokai, but just not, like, the actual that, record. I would have respected that. That would have been funny if they just put Lokai instead of, like, that random Ojama green that's in there and just yes. told them to do nothing with it. I, that that would have been cool. I would like that. Yeah, no, that, that would have actually been based, yeah. So we could sit and talk about the new player experience for a while. And honestly, guess what? That could be a podcast uh, subject. That's probably a topic itself. for its own thing, like how new yeah. players in general experience Yu-Gi-Oh! and how you would attract new players. I think what it comes down to, just to get this to, maybe to get this to a close, is I appreciate the effort, for sure. I like that they're trying something new. <laughs> That's what he's leading with. Well, you I mean, tried. I can't judge whether it's good or not, because I'm not in the position to do so. And I don't think anyone exactly. here is, really, that's already been playing the game for a long time. Um, but I, I like that they, uh, that they acknowledge that new player experience is a problem and it, this is an attempt to solve it and whether it's successful or not is something that we'll find out over time. Maybe there's going to be people in six months at your local telling you how they tried this for the first time with the starter kit and they liked it and that's why they came to locals or whatever, right? And I think that's uh, that the future will tell whether this is good or not, but I like that they're trying it. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think uh, everyone is recognizing that, especially with the uh, what was it that uh, stock uh, broker meeting the 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 stock oh, yeah, shareholder thing where, where the 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 leak yeah. of like uh, the the, the Yu-Gi-Oh investors yeah. are incredibly concerned about certain aspects of the game, like the yes. new player like friendliness, player right? Experience. Yeah. Uh huh. So clearly, steps are being taken and made to. Uh, fix that yeah. issue with the game uh, just because when you have 15 years of new mechanics and new stuff it's going to be complicated so uh, yeah. I would love to test this I would love to get my hands on this product and shove it between two players who've never played I've the game I've been thinking about doing I... exactly that yeah like giving it to two people has never who've never played the game yeah. before and just filming how they how they do with it how they like it and what what they understand and what they take away from it no. Yeah, it'll be a good experiment. Unfortunately, I don't have any friends, uh, so I won't be able to uh, to do that. So <laughs> it is what it is. Uh, I can't wait to... I, I'm, I, I am actually planning to just like play with them, but not like use the tutorial, like just shuffle them up and see if it's fun. Uh, maybe it'll be uh, 
interesting. Well, that's another thing. Um, people have been saying you just use it once and then you throw it away. I don't think that's how people are going to use it. I think the next step for anyone yeah. who's never played the game before would be just, hey, what happens if we play against this, like, by shuffling the cards, you know? Exactly, right. exactly. Oh. All right, uh, let's move on to uh, our next portion on the TCG here. We're talking about the Year of Fire. The Year, the year of, of the, the Fire. Uh, this is... Now, for anyone who's screamed that the, um, the, the two-player starter set is a scam, uh, this next section is for you, as opposed to that <laughs> product. Because we're talking about competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! now. Um, so, Ojama Green and Sparkman are not going to show up in this section. Instead, we're going to be talking about what's going to happen with uh, the Maze of Memories, which is, as at the point of this recording, it has been released uh, today. And uh, the Phantom Nightmare, which is the next core set, is going to release in, I believe, about three weeks. Maybe it's four. I don't know. According to my very quick calculations, it's about three to four weeks. And it's on everyone's mind right now when it comes to competitive Yu-Gi-Oh! how um, everyone is probably going to be playing. Uh, fire decks for the next couple months, at least at the top tables. Yeah, no, there's uh the 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 release of Bonfire has really uh cemented itself as the uh, consistency portion of uh, all of the fire decks that are just utilizing this Diabell Star package, and um, even going so far as to play a, a full. Wait, did you get did you get a collector's rare? No, no, it's just a regular uh, for the for the audio viewers. I was showing uh, I was showing the camera a bonfire that I pulled this morning out of my one box of Maze of Millennia. Well. Yeah, so uh, we've seen in the OCG that Fire Kings and Fire King variants and even Bellstar, um, Pure and yep. Snake Eye decks uh, together um, yep. have or have been just dominating. Like Pure Snake Eye is, is what's really surprised it me. It really is. It, it, it really does boil down to the Snake Eye cards, right? Which that's that's one one thing I don't like about those OCG metagame breakdowns that show you like thirty five percent Fire King, fifteen percent Pure Snake Eye, or whatever. Um, they really are all on the backbone of a, a large Snake Eye engine. Like, it's just that the Fire King Snake Eye deck elects to use the Fire King cards, but there's actually, I think there's more Snake Eye cards than Fire King cards in that deck. It's all Snake Eyes, right? It's all Snake Eyes because on top of the support that we're getting, uh, that we already have from Age of Overlord, which is like the Ash, the Birch, the Oak, the Flamberge Dragon, and then obviously some of the spells and the whole Diabell Star Wanted stuff, we're getting uh, Populous in the next set, which is <laughs> honestly one of the most custom cards they've printed in a while for an archetype. Uh, it, I, you could call it circular levels of, of support for Snake Eyes, because what, what Populous does is it just lets you special summon itself whenever, you, whenever it gets added to your hand from your deck, uh, and then on summon, it searches a Snake Eye spell or trap. It might search a trap as well. I'm not entirely sure right now. And when it, sends to, when it gets sent to Graveyard, it even puts itself into, into the spell and trap zone. So it does so many things for that archetype. Um, and it ha it's a pyro again. Uh, so like you just pair that with Bonfire, which is just Rhoda for pyros. You can trigger it that way. You can search with Snake Eye Ash, right? And so it, it all it, it equals so many free materials on the board that really the backbone to all of these decks, whether it's Fire King, Rescue Ace, Pure Snake Eye, whatever other fire deck you can cook up is really just the Snake Eyes, right? On top of also the new Fire Link 3, the, the bestowing Princess of, of Flames or whatever that's already in Master Duel, um, that card also plays a huge role because it's just uh, one of the best generic Fire Links ever printed. Yeah, I, I think there was a very clear intentional design like pathway when yeah. all of these cards were being made. Yeah. Uh, the synergies with the fire. Yeah type uh attribute rather um is is like so obvious uh yeah. and then to also further than that make a card like bonfire which is just straight up like it's very weird it's like <laughs> it's not often we get a generic spell that has like two words on it that is just so powerful but it is just as simple as like yeah this card is just three more copies of the best card in your deck i mean yeah uh, reinforcement is... of the army is still limited and it's a card from yeah. like over 20 years ago and um, I mean, it's, it's especially funny to me because when I read Bonfire for the first time, you know, we always react to newly announced cards on stream. And it's like, I read the card and I was like, I mean, that's obviously powerful, but who knows how useful it's going to be because Pyro is not the most loved archetype over the history of this game, right? There's not that many broken Pyro cards out there. And they were like, okay, bet, we're going to make them, right? We're just going to make these. Uh, and now, now you have valuable targets for Bonfire and that's all it needs. There only has to be one good target for Bonfire for that card to pop off, right? They're, they're, it's it's only really the Snake Eye stuff. Everything else is like fine that you can do with Bonfire. But um, 
as long as you have one broken target for bonfire there you go card is meta relevant and uh and and here it is and uh, tinfoil hat on i also don't think it's a coincidence that they made the the flame swordsman stuff exactly now which is all fire yeah no that's uh, i don't think there's any pyros among them but there's uh they're all fire they all work really well with but the they have uh, great that's synergy something we're with... going to talk about as well yeah they have uh, they have but... great synergy with fire king island because you can pop one of them in hand and it has an effect when it's destroyed as well yeah the uh the the flame swordsman stuff is like looking we'll talk about that in a moment but yeah, yeah. it's looking like it's it's really really i don't want to say good but it's interesting it's really cool that there's like an anime deck that has like synergies with this but here's the problem <laughs> uh bonfire just works in everything yeah. and the snake eye stuff just works in everything and the three of searchers is secret rare and uh yeah you know that's yeah. that's that's rough for a lot of people that really is you know, mandatory game pieces if you want to play anything involving fire and it, it's yeah. kind of just I can I can totally understand why people are not super happy with the rarities of something like Bonfire. Um so that's kind of like the unfortunate part of this, especially when it isn't even like, yeah, this is just like a decent deck. This is like the best deck. Like they're all they yeah. all run one bonfire. Yeah. They all run wanted. Um so yeah, there's there's that. so many aspects to this discussion that it's got probably going to fill up a decent portion of this thing. But the the fact that Yu-Gi-Oh cards are expensive is something that I mean, it's been like this forever, right? This is why I don't like people saying like, "Oh, but we've survived Teledad format." You know, well, remember Teledad where a crush card was a thousand bucks? I'm like, yeah, I mean, I remember, but that doesn't mean I'm happy with paying for the stuff <laughs> now, right? Okay, I'm 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 glad you lived through paying a thousand bucks for a crush card. I don't want to do it again though, right? So. It's a really uh, weird analogy. Like, yeah, we survived the Teladad for Yeah, we also survived like World War Two. Like, we're, what you want to do that okay, again? Good. Like, All right. Okay. You know, like, I was gonna. I was gonna here? refrain from making references like that in the first episode, but here we go. Okay. Cool. <laughs> we're gonna compare uh, Teladad format to World War Two. Okay. Here we go. That's good. Good stuff. Like a pandemic, if you ask me. I guess so. <laughs> sure. Um. But yeah, Bonfire, you know, let's be real. It's only as good as its targets, right? Like, it's only as good as, good as what it searches. That's why I've always said low-key, Medallion of the Ice Barrier is one of the best cards ever made. It just happens to be in an absolute doo-doo archetype. It is what it is. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, that's, uh, that, that's, that's what it comes down to. Bonfire is a card that is only as good as its targets. And eventually, one day, I can probably see it getting... Uh, get those Snake Eye cards will get hit. But until then, until then, unfortunately, a lot of players... Are just gonna feel like they're priced out of this meta game, right? Um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 a little bit a matter of what you are trying to achieve, right? Because the fire decks are obviously going to be. I, my prediction is they are going to be the best decks of the format, but they are not going to be the only decks of the format. This is also something that the OCG currently shows. It shows the fire decks being successful in large numbers, but there's a lot of other stuff that also competes. Uh, and people are getting success with other stuff, so it is possible to play something else. However, I can still totally understand for anyone who is trying to take this game seriously that it's frustrating that if that feeling like if you want to have the best chances of winning, then you uh, even if it's just a locals, right? Even if it's just locals where you could say like, oh, it's not that important. But it's like, I mean, winning locals is still something that people care about and should care about if it's something that that's important to you. Uh, knowing that you're not going to have the best chances possible because those cards are so expensive is frustrating that's always um, a contextual thing as well because like i don't oh, know yeah. where some of you guys live but where my locals is like people play meta decks like people are yeah. picking up the new cards they play like the top tier meta cards and decks um like it's not exactly like a super try hard sweat fest but like they in the end like it's not really fun to play with like yeah. you know memento against you know a wanted deck right like you're yeah. you're just like you know for some people it's I guess like it showing up with cards like that and decks like that is fine, but for a lot of players, like yeah, it's not the most tryhard thing ever. But if you still use like a decent deck and a meta deck, like you're gonna need those relevant pieces to actually take part. And I think for a yeah. lot of players, that's uh that's upsetting that you know Bonfire is gonna put so many of these fire decks really far ahead, and on top of that, with the Phantom Nightmare support. So yeah, maybe we can talk a little bit about the uh, alternatives. Do you think? Uh, I mean. One thing that's interesting from the newer stuff is like you're going to get Voiceless Voice, which is a ritual-based archetype, which we hadn't had a cool ritual-based archetype in a while, and Drytron does not count as a cool ritual-based archetype. I'm just <laughs> Cool before. ritual deck, by the way. <laughs> no, Voiceless Voice is cool. I've seen some replays. It's it's cool. It's kind of this new take on the Sephira 
uh, like the the old school rituals. I believe it's Safira. It's the uh, what even what even is the name? Zoravis, and there's a third one in there that's never been relevant at all whatsoever. Um, I forgot its name. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, yeah, but yeah, the skull skull guardian, right? Skull guardian. Yeah, and it, it's kind of given this archetype. They, now these three together form an archetype, which previously I think they had nothing to do with each other. They were like, okay, but well, we should let these guys join forces, which I suppose is cool. And um, really showing your lore knowledge there. They do you have more knowledge of these belonging together? No, I just I'm like, just okay. Okay, it's just interesting I, to see you right. make these draw these links together where I did not see that previously, but sure. The links are are made the fuck up, is what I'm saying. <laughs> I made it the fuck up. <laughs> but they are now. That's what I'm saying. Now they belong together. Now they are mentioned on the same cards and all that. Yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, that, that that deck is cool, and it is competing in the OCG at the moment at decent numbers. And obviously, some of the older stuff. And I think this is the biggest criticism to the recent ban list, which at first glance, uh, it, I so thought it was an amazing ban list. On, what's the uh, what's the context of uh, the voiceless voice? Because I haven't looked into it. What is like the play style? What's like the general gameplay loop of the deck? Uh, it's it's a lot about the Viner, I believe. Like they got they got that little little Novox disciple guy, which is a level one fairy, which does a lot for the deck. And they, the, I think the rituals also get bonus effects when that thing is around. And uh, so you try to like use the Viner and then tribute the Diviner to get that thing out of your deck. And you got like you got like an annoying, uh, some annoying continuous cards that protect your stuff. It's been a while since I've read the cards. I'm just, I've just seen that they have some neat combos and they got uh, decent success in the OCG. Okay. All right. Moving on to the boundless you were saying. Uh, what, what I was saying is, in, at the very first glance, the ban list was amazing, and I think it was a good ban list, mainly because it hit some floodgates, and it, it, like, it slapped the decks in the format that were arguably the best decks on the wrist, right? But what it does now is it significantly uh, weakens the chances for those kind of decks to keep up with the fire stuff, because the fire stuff wasn't really hit besides Rescue Ace, but like I said earlier, all the other Snake Eye decks don't really care about the Rescue Ace hits, and ev everyone who was playing unchained beforehand or pearly even with the small hits or i mean tier limits all those decks have a much smaller chance now to keep up with the fire stuff so you're gonna have to probably cup come up with different things to to combat fire uh, but i think it's not going to be impossible but i still understand the frustration of not being able to play the best deck um but yeah on the topic of card prices though i think one thing that's even more frustrating then a very expensive engine is very expensive non-engine because even though like right now we are in a situation where the most expensive that's every card in the game right <laughs> and expensive that's why i think it's a more engine, general just... general problem than just the the fire stuff that's expensive now I, I think this is just the thing that brought it up right the fact that people people just saw bonfire on top of wanted like wanted was already expensive and maybe people paid a lot of money for wanted and then they were like looking forward to fire they were like okay i'm ready to go uh fire format can happen i got my wanted engine and then pre-sales for a bonfire hit and it was just i don't know how much it is right now i know in europe like uh, it's like 70 bucks for for one copy of bonfire and you need three i i think that's what tipped over and started this discussion again because let's be real Yu Gi Oh has never been cheap ever like, it's not just this format, this upcoming format. I think there's been periods where it's been significantly more manageable than others, but... That is true. To say cheap is, I think, would probably be a stretch, yeah. Yeah. And I think... Um, so my take in general on this, uh, which I just want to, like, I just want to preface by saying, I would love for it to be uh, cheap. I would love for everyone to be able to enjoy this game and not be priced out of playing any meta decks. The reality of things is obviously a little bit different, but I want to like talk about how maybe they could do it in a way that would still let them make enough money because that's another thing I want to tackle is like people are always like, oh, greedy company bad. Uh, I want Konami to make money. I want this game to to flourish. I want them to make ton of tons of money with this beautiful game. I just wish there was a way, and I think there are ways they could do it by making people a little bit more happy and still make money, right? Because Take let's face it, it Take is a company. PayPal. It needs to make money. If they're not making money, they're going to stop making the game. They're not making the game just for our enjoyment. Yeah, in, in, the, in the end, it's a principled point of a business is going to want to continue to have year-on-year -year profits and, uh, well... How do you do that without making cards expensive? I guess is really the bit, the big conundrum in question that hopefully they will meet us in the middle and uh, 
come up with some actual I solutions. Mean, there are solutions like... out there, aren't there? I feel yeah. like yeah. I feel yeah. like this is the point of the video, of the of the podcast where we do have to mention other examples like the OCG rarity system. Mm. Where the game but again, has like been... the thing is, like, we don't know how profitable TCG versus OCG is. Like, I mean, the, the OCG has like... been around for longer than the TCG has. It can't not be profitable. Well, in the sense, well, yeah, of course it'll be profitable, but like to what extent and to what margin, right? I suppose fair, really fair. Weird. So you're saying maybe the OCG is profitable, but the TCG is making more profit. Why wouldn't it, Why wouldn't the OCG switch then? Because I think if you push too hard in one direction or make a big change, then it ends up, you end up risking losing your established customer base, right? Something like that. Okay, I get that. So what you're saying is like they've established this it this way and it's hard to way. change? Yeah, I mean, I think like once you, you know, completely changing and shifting something like the booster box structures over in OCG might like hurt them quite detrimentally. Okay. Right, if they were to like change that overnight or something. No, I'm um, I'm convinced that it wouldn't work in the OCG the way we have it because also another thing I think was worth pointing out is that I think in in the OCG or in Japan or Asia, there's a lot of more competition for card games. They they are playing so many different card games over there. I mean, you've been to Japan this year. We've looked at stores. They play so many different card games. Uh, yeah, like the so if at any point you go is too bad or too expensive, like yeah, I'll just go. Play I some I genuinely think sometimes definitely. in the OCG, like if they if they overdo it with something, people might just turn around and leave or play like their secondary card game or whatever that they they because a lot of them probably play multiples as well. I think that is something, and uh, that is something that is getting more and more relevant. I feel like over the past couple of years, I do think we are getting more and more competition in the trading card game market. When it comes to, it's not just Magic, Pokemon, and Yu-Gi-Oh anymore, right? Obviously, there's been attempts in the past, but the, the 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 recent attempts feel more, to me, they feel more real. Maybe it's because the internet is getting you more connected and you hear more about it. But I feel like uh, things like the One Piece card game, uh, Digimon, they've made like significant waves. Uh, I feel, I feel like. Yeah, for sure. Especially One Piece. That's I feel like kind of shaken up the. Uh card game space although i'm hearing from people that one piece is also getting more and more expensive so maybe that is just something that comes with popularity is that people are willing to spend more money on these cards but no yeah, i think there comes a point where it's like well you know magic and Yu-Gi-Oh are doing fine and they cost like an arm and leg to play in their modern formats or whatever so why can't we and there isn't an alternative right because you can't just go find a cheaper card game in the west i mean you can but like <laughs> you need a you need a player base as well so that's the, uh, it is true that like not pool. having uh, like the competitive scene that Yu-Gi-Oh has, I think, is very much unrivaled between like like all most other competitors. I don't know. I'm I'm pretty sure Magic is probably doing fine in terms of how many options you have to play, and I'm probably Pokemon probably might be fine as well because these are the the big three. But I could definitely imagine struggling finding places to play and people to play with uh, IRL in in these other card games, especially at the start. Um, so yeah, that is one big factor for sure. All right, let's uh, move on to our next uh, major segment here. We're talking about Mastodo. And uh, of course, all of these other previous topics we've touched upon, it was a very sort of light uh, surface level analysis of yeah. some of these subjects. But in the future, you know, leave a comment down below. Tell I, us I am noticing just now, yeah, I'm comment. noticing just now that time does fly a little bit. And uh, I, I feel like... I mean, we're we're shooting for like hour long episodes, which is also something you guys can give us feedback on on how long these should be. Um, but uh, you guys can let us know if you want us to put as many things as possible into one episode, so we have a bunch of topics covered, or we just talk about topics more in depth. You know, like we can we can stretch these topics a lot longer. I feel like. Yeah, for sure, uh, and we can definitely dedicate like specific entire podcasts with relevant um expert guests and stuff yeah. on those uh relevant subjects as well so that's something fun to uh for us to do in the future so we're talking a little bit about Mastodo now and i suppose like the major sh big two changes really is uh the ban list uh big yeah. return of the rulers kind of sort of but also we got a new set here featuring a super heavy samurai a deck which uh didn't really get too much of a time to shine in the tcg uh for a good reason though quickly. yeah but yeah, we've uh, had we've had just to quickly recap because it is important for context. We also did get uh, a relatively large, I want to say, ban list for for Master Duel standards towards the end of the year because normally they don't make them that big, right? 
uh, because they get like one ban list every month ever, yeah. or one uh, every every one and a half months. I don't know exactly what their cycle is, but like usually it's only a couple changes. Uh, this time around, they did not hold back though. They they hit a lot of cards. They banned like Chaos Ruler. They banned so many uh like not banned but they hit a lot of cards out of like stun decks uh like <laughs> banned cardinomize limited inspector border li uh, limited uh, there can be only one limited kaiser coliseum part of duality like so many like even synchro zone got hit which is crazy to me by the way that is a cra that's a crazy thing they they did but uh, yeah that's um, how hard they're hitting floodgates that synchro zone is now getting caught in the crossfire but yeah we've got a uh, we've got super heavy samurai in the radar and from what i've seen yeah. from all of the solar kind of smaller tournaments you know dk meta weeklies or whatever like super heavy samurai seem to be doing really really well and mm -hmm. i think like just as a general sort of primer i'm not sure how healthy a deck like super heavy is in best of one form oh i'm like, pretty sure how healthy it is <laughs> I'm pretty it's... sure. I'm pretty sure on my opinion on how healthy Super Heavy Samurai is for for Mass Duel, and uh, the answer is not very. Yeah, the answer like, is not very. So Super you have Heavy a very Samurai... long sort of. It's a combo deck that takes forever to play out, and those are generally going to be polarizing. So unless unless you're the one playing it, like it's 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 always like weird. Uh, but yeah. then it's like the counterplay to that in TCG was always like, you know, you've got like a lot of good like side options for uh, Super Heavy that kind of folds to like things like Droll and stuff like that. Yeah. And you're kind of just forced to play that now in Masado, yeah. right? At the at the higher ranks. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it just feels like it's so high rolly now. There's Maxi, there's yeah. Droll. And like, it, it just feels like you're constantly, your deck building is always at the mercy of like, just what has your opponent queued and opened, right? Super Heavy so Samurai, like, as a deck, is incredibly polarizing because... And I, I also think it's always... The deck always is fun for one player and not fun for the other. Because you either... Even if you're the Super Heavy Samurai player, getting drolled and passing your turn and just dying is also not very fun. Uh, playing against Super Heavy Samurai, not having the droll is not very fun. Of course, you're having the time of your life if you droll them and they just pass. But it's the, the point I'm trying to make is no matter what you're doing is um like you're one of the two players involved is not going to have fun cuz super heavy the entire concept of super heavy samurai is just not fun it's just like make a overly oppressive board or lose the game um and then it's even worse in best of one best of one amplifies this problem by a lot because like you said there are cards to tackle super heavy samurai which only because cards exist that counter a certain strategy does not make that strategy okay only because there are cards that beat this combo deck does not mean the combo deck is fine. Um, and, I mean, something like Max C, any, everyone is playing anyways. But a card like Droll and Lockbird in best of one, I've, I've noticed it myself when I played a bunch of uh, Master Duel on the, on the last, uh, like, on the day that they, these things were released. Uh, it's super polarizing, even when I'm not playing against Super Heavy Samurai. Because let me tell you, feeling forced to put cards like Droll and Lockbird or Ghost Ogre into my deck just to not auto lose to super heavy samurai if i lose the the coin flip uh it feels terrible when i'm queuing into labyrinth yeah that's the that's sort of the main kind of issue with best of one it's yeah. hard to deck build for something like that especially when you have a wide different spread of uh very very varied win conditions uh yeah. combo and uh, control deck like you're going to be sitting there with droll in your hand against like okay great i guess i get to hit your one of extravagance maybe it kills your ariana normal summon right like there, <laughs> I mean, it doesn't feel good at all no it uh, doesn't and i don't know what a solution to this really is uh, the I solution just is ban the uh, super heavy samurai and not yeah, don't the, make the, something just, like this ever again please just, just just go with the tcg strategy of uh you just hit it immediately like i mean ASAP, is, isn't please. super heavy samurai genuinely the deck that has died in the tcg the fastest ever mm, depends how you want to say how you want to define died i mean pepe was like 13 days it just sort of became a weird draco pal variant but... okay but how long was how long was super heavy samurai actually like was it two weeks i feel like no it wasn't weeks right it was like at least like two months no was there, there was no way it was two months really Okay, someone in chat is saying less than a month. Wow, that's crazy. It was less than a um, month. It, it was definitely... The, the ban list was announced shortly after the set dropped, and it was in effect like two to three weeks after. You know, and it's funny because like people still complain about it because it was uh, it was not a very super expensive deck. It was actually... Rel if you had like some of those generic staples... Well, oh my, but like cards. if you really think about it, that was most likely only because they planned on gutting it immediately. 
Yeah, exactly. Like, there's no way Vakau they couldn't, they could not make Vakaushi a secret rare because they knew they were going to hit that deck. Because yep. if they didn't plan on hitting the deck, Vakaushi was going to be a secret rare and you, was, you were going to pay 60 each or some shit and then complain just like two months later. So think about this it. This is that why way. Link 1 monsters are, uh, can be a bit of a problem. You look at a card like Soul Piercer, which was printed before Ash Blossom, before Master Rule 4. Heck, it might have been printed before Dante. That's how old Super Heavy Samurai technically is. And then yeah. they just printed Wakaoshi and a Link 1, and here we are today. So, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a deck that just can get completely out of control with the right, with the right support card. And we talk about circular as the meme of uh, the one card combos but you know all it takes really is is one single card sometimes that does just enough and it 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 takes a deck to the moon yeah. um and specifically in Macedo when it comes out it's it's rough so i don't know what the general feedback is from the player base it, uh, i can't imagine it being positive i haven't heard a single person talk very positive about super heavy samurai like i think yeah. I, I don't even think it's that deck's power level um, because I think it's a good deck, but from just a raw, like if you were to just look at the raw stats of like the win rate, I don't think it's that crazy because people are, you know, the deck does lose because it doesn't play spells and traps. The only way you really have to stop something like a maxi is you have to draw an ash or you're going to lose. Like I, I've, I haven't experienced the win rate of the deck being like through the roof. It's not like an Ishizu tier level problem in terms of the deck is just too powerful. Um, because it does have its fair share of just auto loses. Um, so it's not oppressive in terms of its win rate. It just creates a whole lot of... A deck can be a big problem even without being too strong in terms of its win rate. It's just a toxic design. Yeah, decks like that never really seem to be like the best decks anyway because they're very fragile. Um, yeah. And when they are strong, they're like strong, but they're, you know, they can be very beatable if you just draw the right card, which is what tanks their, uh, their win rate so low. Yeah. Uh, but I think for, the, for, for most players, the issue with Super Heavy Samurai is that it, like you've mentioned, it, it just creates very unfun games for one of the players like there is there is no game where both players enjoy a super heavy samurai duel let alone a very very, very rarely really. and it usually has yeah. to like include both people either somewhat bricking or having a bunch of hand traps to stop each other from killing them on the first turn so they, yeah. they just like get in this weird grindy spot where like there's but that's it's very rare the the general design of the deck is just not uh not that cool so let's talk a little bit about the uh Big major change of the list, which I feel like hasn't done too much yet, but Dragon Rulers, baby, we're back <laughs> three now. Dragon, they have changed a lot. They have cost me uh, 360 ultra rare CP, which I felt that change. Oh, you tried to make I it? Tried. Okay, all right. How I was tried, that and I felt I felt that change a lot in my pocket. Um, what did you uh, What did you make? What did you do with it? I built so initially. I was just gonna make. I was just going to try to make it as viable as possible, which unfortunately, I hate to inform you, is probably just by making a Tomahawk Turbo deck. Yeah. Um, and okay. then I thought to myself, isn't it incredibly sad that the only way to use these previously super grindy and powerful cards to just make another turn one combo deck? And uh, all I'm doing is I need to draw... Now I need to draw like three card combos instead of one Vakaoshi to win the game on turn one. So I kind of skipped that idea and I was like, I don't want to play it like that. Um, but I also don't see a grindy dragon ruler approach working in, in the year 2024. So I waited, I was patient for the, for the event that happened yesterday, the theme chronicles where a lot of stuff is banned. So I was like, okay, maybe this is my chance. And I built a dragon ruler deck that is awfully similar to what people would play in 2013. You can play it almost the exact same way, which is very funny. Um, and even then it, 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 it didn't really work that well. You know, the one thing that Dragon Ruler had going for it was that it's extremely easy to make level 8 synchros. And unfortunately, we had yeah. a bit of a casualty in the level 8 synchro department <laughs> with the ban list. So it never really seemed to... Uh, it didn't even have that as a fallback, I don't. I genuinely so. don't think that's the problem. And I don't think that was the main selling point of playing Dragon Rulers back in the day. I think that the unfortunate... Well, I, I don't think uh, Magic Dragon was the main selling point of Dragon Ruler back in the day, right? No, no, I mean, like, the, the ability to make level 8 synchros. But I, the, the way I see it... The was insane, what do you mean? I mean, they were good, they would use them. But the main selling point of Dragon Rulers back in the day was that they had incredible advantage over multiple turns. Because if you look at it from a today's perspective, the unfortunate reality is that usually grind game 
in decks comes from sort of bonus effects on cards. Like uh, still, usually cards that are playable these days, they, they do a lot of their stuff. They, they need to front load a lot of their value. The, the grind game just comes from, hey, this card has a random graveyard effect that lets you shuffle stuff back into the deck and draw cards. Or this card has a random bonus effect that makes it add itself back to the hand in the end phase. But that's never the main reason to play a card, right? Most of the cards are being played for their immediate impact in a game that is a um, lot faster than back in the day. And that is not something that dragon rulers do. Dragon rulers don't front load their value. Dragon rulers do the, their stuff over time, right? The fact that you, hey, I come back from the graveyard for free if you banish two other dragons from the graveyard. And then next turn, you can do it again. And then the turn after, you can do it again. And if you banish me for the cost of another dragon ruler, I will replace myself. Uh, you can't use any other of my effects this turn, but next turn you can, right? And this is just something that... Uh, if I ever made it to turn three in Master Duel yesterday, I was happy because I would banish like Tidal and Blaster for my Tempest and I was popping off. Um, if we made it to turn three. I didn't get there I that often. I think the uh, biggest uh, takeaway from Dragon Rulers is that they're too fair in 2024, which is insane to say. But it is if they something were printed... that you would not believe if you told me. I would not believe that if you told me that 11 yeah. years ago. Yeah. You know, when I was, when I was, uh, when I was in my, uh, in my, in my, in my diapers 10 years ago that 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 didn't actually happen and you said that dragon would be would be a, a, a power creeped mid-range decker so i just wouldn't believe you yeah. so the issue with dragon rulers is like if they were printed today unironically they would all those three effects the hand the banish the grave effect uh the special summon effect they would not be once per turn well they would be once you per turn but not once each. per yeah yeah use. yeah you could probably use each yeah like and the thing is, like, I don't even know how good that would be. Even then, yeah, like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, like, if that would break them. I don't, I don't think it would. I, I'm I genuinely sure it would do don't think it would. Like, the problem is, like, to what end, right? Because, like, Dragon Rollers have always been a deck that are very good at making level uh, 8 synchros and rank 7 plays. And yeah. what do you really do with that today? No, the Come reality on, is, right? if you want to make Dragon Ruler work, I, I genuinely think you could make a Master Duel Dragon Ruler deck that wouldn't be terrible, but it would genuinely just be... Uh, a tomahawk combo pile right and you would make it this crazy tomahawk combo pile that makes a, as strong as a turn one board as possible by going through like aurora dawn all that kind of stuff emptying your entire extra deck and your the main selling point of that deck would probably be that even if your opponent does have something like a dark ruler in their deck which which like then and then outs your entire board you have like these thingies in the graveyard that will make sure that you can end the game the next turn right that's what it would do which doesn't it doesn't make it a better combo deck than other combo decks that exist out there but it would make it a combo deck that exists somewhere in the rogue um thingy because even if you have a way to i don't know impermnibiru it or dark ruler it or droplet or sphere mode or whatever you know like they might be out of extra deck resources but the dragon rulers keep coming back from the graveyard and that way you can you can still bring home the game right um that's not the deck i want to play though so like it, that's why it felt particularly uh disappointing for me as someone who liked the dragon ruler grind game back in the day right the back and forth is what i really valued and i didn't really get that out of my out of my dragon ruler stream uh, yesterday let me tell you that well on the plus side you get to play that as a uh as a as a mirror match now if you really want to you can just craft all those cards it is it is now doable you can all yeah, you can play. It. You can play 2013 format, right? Yeah, I don't think there's any rulings or uh, master rules that have affected it too much. You well, can, the sixth, you, you would draw you. a sixth card back in the day for the opener, oh, but yeah, you can. Yeah, you would, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, well, there you go. Blind second rules is how you got to do it. Um, <laughs> you, it's funny you <laughs> have spellbooks as well. Spellbooks is also yes. at full power from that era. I'm pretty sure all of the cards from spellbooks are legal in Master Duel. You can genuinely play both of those. The only thing we don't have is Vanity's emptiness. That's true. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this is the part of the segment where we would probably move on to Patreon questions if we do decide to make a Patreon for this. We'll see how uh, intrigued <laughs> and how well this is going in terms of uh, your interest. Um, yeah. So yeah, leave a comment, watch, share with your friends, etc. Et so if you guys have enjoyed this episode, please let us know how we can improve and make it better. Uh, what guests and topics you want to hear from and hopefully uh, most more of you keep tuning in week to week. So it's been really fun and it's exciting, but um, rather than doing Patreon questions, I'm going to take some questions from the Twitch chat live here for uh, the next 10 minutes or so. Yep. Uh, just feel free to drop something. We don't really have a specific topic because today's first inaugural episode, we would start with something a little bit more generic and a little bit more broad. 
so feel free to drop anything in the chat here that maybe Josh can have a little scroll through just now and pick something out for us. You want um, me yeah, to pick just, the questions? Yeah, yeah, just pick a couple just now. Um, we're gonna have the uh, we're gonna have this uh, uploaded as as we've mentioned at the start. If you're just joining in live, uh, you, you will be able to watch this live um, on my stream or Josh's stream. We're gonna be alternating week to week depending yeah. on who's available, schedule, and that kind of stuff. Um, so make sure you do follow us both on Twitch, our social medias, etc., and do subscribe to the Heart of the Cast YouTube channel if you want to get the full visual experience as well. All right. And the, the release any, day, uh, the release day for this is always going to be what did we say? Sundays, Saturdays or Sundays? Yeah. Yep. And our recording is probably going to be sometime midweek live on Twitch mm -hmm. around about the afternoon in EU. All right. First, uh, I'm going through this question. Some of these are obviously troll questions because we're doing it live with the Twitch chat. So that is something I have to work my way through. Um, That's why we need a Patreon to get through the uh, <laughs> get through the Patreon questions. There's something a little bit more structured. All right. I know you briefly talked about how OCG could probably uh, probably couldn't adapt the TCG structure of sets, but what exactly is the barrier for the TCG to adapt that structure? Is this the uh, actual box structure of the of the? Cards? Well, the, I'm assuming what they're referring to is the uh, having the main thing in the OCG is that all the cards or most of the hollows are available in different rarities, so you can shoot for yeah. a low rare that wanted or a high rare wanted, depending on what you want to do, and then the lower one would be more affordable because it's printed as like a super rare, for example, right? Yeah, I mean, I think that would be ideal, right? Because you have the game pieces available to you. And for those who are interested in actually getting uh, the cards in a higher rarity just because they want to and because it's fun and yeah. we like uh, shiny cards, then that option is available to you as well. So that's the, right that's now, the currently... consumer side, right? That's like that's what we as the players would want. The question is, why is Konami not doing it? Apparently, because they think it would perform less like it wouldn't perform as well as they're doing it right now and i think uh, i think one point that you said earlier um i think makes a lot of sense to me is just the fact that they have not been doing it like this for like 20 years and i do think in big companies when something has been working out they have very little incentive to change it i think uh, i think it's as simple as as long as they don't see any serious repercussions or like you know loss of income I don't think they are willing to change a system that is working for a system that might not be working because they have 20 years of experience doing the one thing and almost no experience doing the other thing. Um, and it's the not like the major like, thing for a business is, yeah. is always going to be uh, their profits, their revenue share and the happiness of their shareholders. And yeah. so long as Yu-Gi-Oh! keeps providing, then they're just not going to change anything dramatically, right? So... Yeah realistically if you are very frustrated or unhappy with it the best way to voice your concern is you you voice it with your wallet and that's really the only way to make companies of this size listen and that's fair a lot of people are maybe in that boat but realistically the game keeps growing the game keeps doing well and if it ain't broke if, if it ain't broke uh don't fix it right? yeah, i mean like, that's that's, a, kinda... that's the thing right there's there's a lot of people that are willing to pay these prices and i'm i'm a, i'm i'm in the same boat you know for me it is worth it to to pay these prices to play this game um i can still hope for change but i personally am not in the boat of i'm gonna stop playing it if they don't change this and i think that is the position that a lot of people have and this is why they haven't been doing it i think it's as simple as that and I'm not telling you to boycott Yu-Gi-Oh or anything like that. It's something that you need to decide for yourself. I, like I said, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna boycott anything. I'm gonna get myself that playset of Bonfire because I'm, I want to play probably a fire deck in the upcoming format. He's and weak. for me personally, He's weak. I, I, I feel fortunate enough to afford it, and because it is a luxury to be able to play this game at a competitive level and keep up with it, I feel very, I feel very blessed to be able to do that. Um. And I wish more people could, but um, yeah, it, it's up to each individual, I suppose. For me personally, I'm going to be trying out alternatives to uh, fire decks. Personally, I'm going to see if I can still make, uh, thank you, Tiaramint's strongest for as long <laughs> as possible. Maybe try out a little bit of Labyrinth as well. Yeah, um, I, th so I think that kind of there is, that's, that is a good like ver word of positivity out there is I don't, th I genuinely don't think um, you're going to be forced to play a fire deck if you want to win your locals. I think, uh, of course, if you want to win a YCS, you're probably going to 
But the people that the people that want to win a YCS are usually invested enough into the game where it's like at that very, very high level, that sort of stuff usually isn't a problem because people will either be willing to spend that money, be able to spend that money, or have the means to borrow the cards. Because if you're very, like, you know, if you have a lot of connection inside the community, usually you'll find someone who got an extra wanted or something like that. Um, I think for people that are just here to enjoy the game, play locals, play regionals, there's going to be plenty of ways to do that without playing a fire deck. And even though you have, you'll have to live with the knowledge that you're not playing the best deck in the entire room, um, that is not necessarily an issue for everyone, right? Is 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 another thing. And for some, it might even be a fun challenge. I know, I definitely know. There's a lot of people who pride themselves on not playing the best deck, right, and trying to make something else work. What are your thoughts on the Duel Links uh, ban list structure? So, for context, for those of you who don't know, the way it works over in Duel Links is a card that is limited to three, uh, you can only play cards that are all limited to three at three. So for example, uh, if Ash Blossom is limited to three and Maxi is limited to three, you can only play um, copies up to that number three. So you, you can, can play, play two, two Ash, one Maxi. One Ash. You can play three Ash, no Maxi, yeah. Yeah. This is something that I wish that they played around with for the three versus three formats. Um, it would have been a very unique type of structure they did for Master uh, Duel Worlds. Way to deck build. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. in Master Duel, that is exactly how it works. You have a shared card pool, yeah. um, which isn't exactly how Duel Links works. But yeah. the idea that you can have cards that are like really good in the game and they get limited to three is it could be like an interesting I... idea. I think it's interesting. Uh, I would I would always be interested in like I'm always interested in these kind of alternative ways to to play the game or how they could potentially change it. I think. First of all, it's never going to happen because we have a running system for over 20 years of a, of the other way of doing a ban list and they're never going to change that. Just shoot them it, down immediately, Josh. I get it. Okay. I mean, it's hey, it, it, it is what it is. It's not going to happen. They're not going to do that. It's it's a fun thought experiment, but it's it's not more than that, I don't think. But the um, the reality is, I think it might get very, very complicated with the size of the card wool that we have. I don't know if Duel Links is running into that sort of problem. But I know that the Duel Links card pool is significantly smaller. And also the decks that you're trying to build are smaller because it's like 20 cards instead of 40. So applying this thing to like a card pool of, I don't know how many Yu-Gi-Oh card, Yu -Oh cards there are by now, like 11,000, 12,000, I don't know the exact number, but applying that sort Over of thing, 12. hey, we have 100 cards that are all limited to three, uh, pick three out of these possible 300 cards for your deck. It's, it sounds hard to that really do. The uh, issue I found with it in Duel Links was like, it was it was very kind of complicated isn't the word, but it's just like there's so much to like to think about in that sense mm -hmm. um, and to keep track of. And I think in the TCG, if you were to just do like a hypothetical like Duel Links style ban list, it would be like a really fun experimental tournament um, or a format or something. <laughs> but it's definitely not something that would run. I'm pretty sure like 50% of the people would bring illegal decks to the first tournament though. Yeah, that's probably the the funny thing, right? Like, how many like deckless errors would you get? <laughs> Significant <laughs> amounts, right? Like, that's just always what happens. Uh, All right. Um, should we do one more question? Sure, you pick. Uh, all right. Let's. See. I'm just seeing at whatever is jumped out here. Uh, here's an interesting one. Do you think Yu-Gi-Oh! problem-solving card tech should be improved in order to help new player friendliness? Well, the answer to that very quickly is obviously yes, but mm -hmm. the more complicated question there is how. How do you uh, deal with the card text of Yu-Gi-Oh! Because I think, personally at least, I don't know, maybe other people are completely fine with it. Uh, I think Yu-Gi-Oh! card text is at a point where there is just so much bloat of information that it's very hard to sort of just quickly glance at a card mm -hmm. and find the information you're looking for. Uh, I like Rush the way Duel, they number the effects in the OCG. Yeah, so the OCG structure has like bullet points. Yeah. And Rush Duel recently, they have sort of like activation and then effect, right? And then you have like the sort of um, that that is kind of how you uh, can differentiate quite easily. Because currently, like as it stands in TCG, like when you look at a card, it is just a block of text, right? Mm -hmm. And a card that has like three separate relevant effects. Like yeah. even something like a dragon ruler, for example, right? Like you look at that, that's like, that's three unique effects, right? With yeah. uh, conditions and restrictions. Yeah. So that's like four separate unique sentences that you need to know. And it's just like a blob, right? So how do you, how do you organize that? Yeah, I would like to, I would like to have 
I haven't thought about it in detail because you just brought it up, but something like maybe uh, identifying certain parts of a card's effect or something like, you know, have a keyword for this is the cost of, of this specifically, right? This is the cost. This is, I don't know, step one of the effect because like then there's things that are being done simultaneously. Then there's things that happen one after another. Surely there's a better way to to mm -hmm. make that apparent on the card rather than having to know that then means they don't happen simultaneously but and if you do you know all that kind of stuff right it's like surely there's a better way than having distinct keywords for uh, like no I, I don't know yeah keywords is a very very uh controversial uh point here um because you know number one it's uh imitating other card games even though like that that's always sort of been the standard for a while now you see hold um, up hold up I... chat right chat right now people in the audio won't be able to see the chat but someone in chat is proving me right at this moment because they said in all caps before semi column is a cost which is it proves my point because you're wrong not everything before the semi colon of a card effect is the cost <laughs> so <laughs> It's also like that's not the point anyway. Like, yeah, sure, everything before a semicolon, but it's like really that's the clearest form of like differentiating uh text and effects on a card is really is like we're just gonna have like a punk one single punctuation mark. Like, no, you can have clearer things, right? We yeah. can have bold text, we can have new lines, we can have uh the OCG like numbering system, like there's different ways than just like a colon. Yeah. Uh like that's just grammar for a normal person, right? Like that they won't be able to glance at that and really yeah. understand why that's there. Uh, but yeah, the um, the the keyword thing I think is pretty cool. You know, uh, there was a very very good Reddit post posted a uh, while back. I don't mm -hmm. think I made a video on it. I really wanted to, but it had like an incredible like uh, breakdown of like a potential suggestive method for changing the card text. And one of the things that really stuck out with me was like, I think one of the best points is like a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh cards have like so much. Um, uh, introduction, you know, epilogue, forward, and then the conclusion, right? Where it's like a lot mm -hmm. of stuff that you don't really care about, right? It's like the this card uh, cannot be normal or summoned, uh, must be special by first, do it, right? That that's so much stuff yeah. just on like how the card is even summoned. Like we haven't even yeah. got to like what the card does yet. Like yeah. when we're dedicating like two sentences to like how we even summon this card, yeah. Um, things like that, I think definitely need cleaned up. Personally, I'm a, I'm the fan of like um some keywords. I think going over the top where there's like literally like what maybe like 30 plus in magic and hearthstone right now that's that's mm. a bit obscene yeah. um but yeah something like uh having battle cry in hearthstone is like on summon effect yeah something you know, that you can clearly differentiate from the effect like something you can even make like a way to make it so that the effect of a card looks different from the cost of the card or the summoning requirement or the whatever right like the, the way that you can differentiate these to know like okay this card is on the field right now which part of its effect text do I have to look at if I want to know what's relevant for me, right? Like when, mm -hmm. when it, for example, if you had an effect in, in, in Hearthstone that would only happen when a card leaves the field is like, it would be called, what was it, a death rattle, right? Yep. So if a card has a death rattle, if I want to check if it does something right now, I can, I can just glance at it and be like, okay, this death rattle thing, I can ignore it for now because it doesn't have an impact on me while the card is on the field, right? So if I'm looking for, for example, th one situation that came up to like in my mind right now is it happens very often if I'm playing against a deck that I don't know or cards that I don't know that I am not very certain if they have 10 cards in their graveyard and I just want to know, does any of those, do any of those cards in the graveyard do anything? Right? Do yeah, I, do I have like to care about any of the stuff in the graveyard as well or can I just stick to trying to out your board, right? Because sometimes there's like a random negate somewhere in the graveyard or banish this card if something would be destroyed. And there's no quick way for me to figure that out because I have to read every single card from start to finish if I want to know if it does something in the graveyard. Yeah, and imagine like you've never played against that deck before because, you know, you can like read some cards. You're like, okay, I don't need to read that one. I know that's the searcher. That's like the battle one. Yeah. Um, but if you're like a new player, it's like you have to start from scratch and like read all of them. It's like uh, so much information overload. But yeah, card text, is, I think, is 100% something that can be yeah. uh, that can be restructured and worked upon. And honestly, could be potentially a podcast topic. I, I'm also topic. just now, I, there's so many things I want to say, but I feel like for one chat question, we're, we're being one guide way too hard right now. <laughs> and uh, 
it's like the, this sort of thing you really you really need to sit down and prepare your arguments i feel like and and this is something we could go on for a lot longer so that's probably going yeah. on the list like I said, of we can yeah. uh, this could absolutely just be like a, an entire segment in of yeah. itself so i uh, hope you guys enjoyed this first little introductory episode from yep. myself and joshua schmidt i hope you uh had a good little time just uh sitting back relaxing or doing what you got to do and you just have some nice background noise and that's really what the uh, goal of this is because we're big fans of like you know long form content and having something a little bit more in depth is uh is always fun to listen into and hopefully we'll get something like this going for you weekly uh yep. most important of all any suggestions feedback you may have please do you, please do leave it in the comment section below uh this will be going live on youtube this weekend you probably also may be listening to us on spotify so make sure you can follow the channel i think that's how that works on that platform <laughs> i have no um, idea how that works do whatever you can do on spotify <laughs> uh so yeah we will be filming this live uh once a week uh, we might do a couple uh in like the same week just because yeah, yeah, there's we a couple get topics we've been thinking video. about filming in advance because something about yeah. like discussing like i don't know our floodgates good for the game spoilers no uh but our our floodgates good for the game is something we could record like anytime or something like yeah, things like, like this right? that's a that's a podcast that could be released like tomorrow or it can be released like seven months from now it doesn't matter it's always going to be sort of like relevant yeah. discussion uh, also but guest suggestions you... anyone you want to see on the podcast we're definitely open to having guests on and all that kind of stuff but uh, yeah, you know the drill. Give us the feedback. We are very much excited about doing this thing and we hope you guys are going to enjoy it and we're going to see by your um, responses on how well it's going to be received. And uh, yeah. Our next uh, segment, for those who are going to be patiently waiting for it, we're going to be doing a dedicated Master Duel podcast uh, next week uh, for when you are listening to this. Uh, so tune in for that because it is the two-year anniversary. So we're going to be going over all of the uh, technical aspects of uh, Master Duel since release. You know, we're going to be talking about the potential of our tenor formats, what changes they've made, improvements, that kind of stuff. We're going to do a nice little deep dive on the game itself. So tune in for that. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. And from myself and Josh, uh, peace out and have a great day. Bye-bye.